Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome to a brand new series on oral and maxillofacial surgery. So we're going to cover a lot of great topics in this series, and it's by far one of the most requested from my viewers. And it has quite a few questions on the board exam, with about 47 out of the 500. So we'll cover each of these five categories, focusing mostly on surgery and medical assessment and emergency care, which is most frequently tested. So that being said, like all of my videos, I'm going to focus only on the highest yield things you need to know for the exam. Oral and maxillofacial surgery is an incredible specialty, and this is by no means a comprehensive look at all of the procedures that oral surgeons are capable of, but rather unpacking the main concepts from the perspective of a general dentist. So in that respect, my hope is that these videos will help you prepare for the board exam and can also give you a nice overview for clinical application and general knowledge. All right, so extraction refers to the removal of a tooth. Now, permanent teeth are meant to last a lifetime, and modern dentistry principle is to preserve and save all of the natural teeth that we can. But there are some situations where extraction is a reasonable and sometimes even necessary treatment option. So these are some of the situations where extraction may be indicated as a valid treatment option. The tooth could be severely damaged by cavities. The tooth could have experienced some major trauma and say, have severe internal root resorption, and this pulpal condition can't be resolved with conventional endodontic treatment and so must be extracted. The tooth could have severe clinical attachment loss all the way to the apex and have a hopeless perioprognosis, which is indicated for extraction. Teeth may need extraction in a severely crowded mouth to make room for orthodontics to be effective and first premolars are the most likely extracted teeth in this case. Cracked teeth, maybe they can't be saved with a crown, impacted teeth, supernumerary teeth that don't have any room to come in, any significant pathology related to a tooth may need to be treated with extraction as well. And this is probably the most important one for the board exam that questionable teeth should be extracted before radiation therapy. And this is to avoid the risk of osteoradionecrosis. So osteoradionecrosis, or ORN for short, refers to dead bone as a result of radiation therapy. So radiation only affects bone in the field of radiation, so head and neck radiation will expose the jaw bones and osteoradionecrosis is usually secondary to tooth extraction since we expose the bony socket. And so you get this irreversibly damaged, exposed necrotic bone. So the idea is to perform all mandatory extractions and those on questionable prognosis teeth before or very soon after radiation therapy to avoid this complication from happening. So how about the opposite side? Now these are relative contraindications, not absolute contraindications or reasons why we would consider not extracting teeth. So brittle or unstable diabetes means that the patient has a higher risk of infection, end-stage renal disease, unstable angina, this is higher risk of medical emergency, Leukemia can cause thrombocytopenia, or a low platelet count, which leads to easy bleeding. Lymphoma, both Hodgkin's or non-Hodgkin's, affects white blood cells and thus messes up the immune system, so you have a higher risk of infection. Hemophilia and platelet disorders, again, a higher propensity for bleeding. Head and neck radiation, well, we just talked about this in the last slide, so it's a high risk of osteoradionecrosis. Now, there's this thing called hyperbaric oxygen therapy that can be used before and after extraction in this case. Now, hyperbaric therapy is controversial if it actually helps or not, but for the board exam, 
know this, that hyperbaric oxygen is beneficial for patients who are at high risk for osteoradionecrosis that we just talked about in the last slide. So hyperbaric treatment allows more oxygen to reach these damaged areas and helps prevent tissues from dying from a lack of blood and oxygen flow. So providing this hyperbaric oxygen therapy for patients who already received head and neck radiation and need an extraction is considered optimal, at least for the board exam. IV bisphosphonates. We talked about this in the oral pathology videos that IV bisphosphonates can cause bisphosphonate-related osteonecrosis of the jaws, or BRONJ for short, if this patient's getting teeth extracted. So instead, we should try to uh, treat the tooth with a root canal therapy or try some other means to restore the tooth. And the last one here is pericoronitis, with, which is infection around the crown of the tooth. And we should try to treat the infection first. So if it's a more severe infection, we can consider antibiotics. If it's less severe, let's say some local factors involved, like a popcorn kernel, we can remove that local factor and hope for the infection to resolve instead of just jumping to extracting the tooth. Okay, so let's talk about impacted teeth. Now this is one of the main indications for getting a tooth extracted. An impacted tooth is one that fails to erupt into the dental arch within the expected time. So this order is incredibly important to know for the board exam. I can almost guarantee you'll get a question on this. These are the three most likely teeth to be impacted. And in order, mandibular third molars, maxillary third molars, and then maxillary canines. So definitely know this. And the primary reason that teeth are impacted is because there's inadequate arch length. So it makes sense that the third molars get crowded out and there's not enough space for them to come in. And that's frequently the case. So definitely, again, I can't stress enough how important it is to know this order. Now on the flip side, we have congenitally missing teeth. These are teeth that fail to form and not directly related to oral surgery, but I did want to include this list Again, this is the three most likely teeth, but this time to be missing. So third molars, maxillary and mandibular are essentially tied. Then maxillary lateral incisors are next. Mandibular second premolars are third. So the three most likely teeth to be missing. Again, another very important order to know for the board exam. All right, so let's talk about the classifications of impacted teeth. Now there are three classification systems I want to talk about in this video. We'll start with the nature of the overlying tissue. And this system you can use for any impacted tooth, although it's most often describes, it's most often used to describe the third molars since they are by far the most commonly impacted tooth. And so our first one, we have three, uh, three categories here. The first is soft tissue impaction. And that's where the height of contour or the bulkiest part of the tooth is above the level of bone. So if bone level is coming here, then our height of contour is above that area. And the gingiva is completely or partially covering the tooth. Now of the three of these that we're gonna talk about, this one is the easiest to extract. Now hard tissue impaction refers to both of the next ones we will talk about. Partial bony impaction is where the height of contour is now below the bone level. And full bony impaction is where the entire tooth is encased in bone. So no part of the tooth comes above bone level. And of the three, this one is the most difficult. So essentially from left to right, we're going from easiest to most difficult. And I do want to stress that the the reason why it's considered the most difficult is because it involves uh, more complex surgical techniques to access the tooth through bone and remove it effectively. So our second classification system is the Winters classification. This one is only for impacted third molars. You can classify both upper and lower third molars, but it's more important to know this classification system for lower molars because as we'll go over in a little bit, 
It provides helpful information about the potential difficulty of the extraction. So this classification doesn't care about the overlying tissues, how much gum tissue is above or the height of contour is. This one is all about the long axis, about the angulation of the third molar. So it's based on the position of the long axis of the third molar in relation to the long axis of the adjacent second molar. So let's go through a couple of examples down here. So a vertical impaction for winters means that the long axis of the second and third molar are parallel, and they're both facing in the same direction. Mesioangular means that the third molar is tipped mesially in relation to the second molar. Now this one of the ones we will talk about is generally considered the easiest for lower third molars. Horizontal impaction for winters means that the uh, long axis of the second molar and third molar are perpendicular and the crown of this tooth is butting up directly against that second molar. Distoangular means that the third molar is tipped distally or way from the second molar. Now of the ones we will talk about, this one's generally considered the most difficult. And the reason for that is because of where that positions the tooth. And you can think of the mandible coming up like this or the ramus ascends here and we have all this dense bone of or the external oblique ridges and it's a lot of dense bone of the mandible that we have to get through in order to get this tooth out and so it's angled in a very uh, unfavorable way in in respect to a nice and easy extraction so that is a difficult extraction i remember d for disto angular and d for difficult now these other other two here are less common. Buccolingual means that the axis is once again perpendicular, but now we're in a different plane here and the crown is facing uh, either us, it's facing the screen, or it's facing away from the screen in the other direction. So the tooth is lying uh, with the long axis in the buccolingual plane. And there are other examples, say if the two teeth are facing away from each other, and things like that and everything in between. So mesioangular is the easiest, distoangular is the most difficult, at least for the board exam, that's what I would remember. And that's for lower third molars. All right, so the third classification system we have is the Pell and Gregory classification. This one is only for lower third molars. So now we're no longer talking about upper and lower, just the lower. And so this classification system is broken down into two parts, A, B, C, and one, two, three, just like the Jackson 5 song. So class A, B, and C, or level A, B, and C, refers to how deep the molar is. So A means that it's the same plane as the other molars. Class B means that the tooth comes down about halfway down from the other molars and see it's completely buried into the mandible or at least it's below the cervical line of the second molar. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, a full bony impaction or partial bony impaction, but it has to be below the second, the cervical line or the CEJ of the second molar. So I remember C, class C or level C and C for cervical. So of the three of these, this one is the most difficult. And again, it's all about bone cover here. We have more bone covering the tooth, and also the roots are coming closer to this inferior alveolar nerve. And we'll talk about uh, cl complications in a little bit in this video and um, how that can cause potential nerve injury. So the other three here are class one through three. And this has to do with how far back the tooth goes in relation to the ramus. So class one is that the, the third molar is anterior to the ramus. Class two is that half of it is embedded in the mandibular ramus. Class three is that the entire crown is within the ramus. So again, we're having the same issue here. 
This is the most difficult because once again, most bone cover and closest proximity to the IAN. So C and three are going to be the most difficult extractions. Um, and so a, a third molar that is both level C and class three, you can imagine will be very, very difficult to extract. All right, so let's talk about some complications of extractions. A subperiosteal abscess refers to um, the, it's the result of a nidus of infection and associated pus trapped underneath the periosteum layer, hence subperiosteal. So it usually occurs when a small piece of necrotic bone or tooth has been left behind underneath a flap following a surgical extraction. And we'll talk about simple versus surgical extractions in a later video. So this is possible whenever a mucoperiosteal flap is elevated for surgical extraction. And how you avoid this is to irrigate thoroughly to remove any of those uh, fractured tooth pieces or bony spicules below the soft tissue, below the periosteum layer, so that when we close the flap up, there's nothing left behind. The next complication is oroantral communication, or OAC, and it's also referred to or known as a sinus exposure. Oroantral makes sense because it's a communication between the oral cavity and the antrum, which is another name for the sinus. So this is most common with the maxillary first molars, and the best way to prevent an OAC is to have good pre-op radiographs that show the level of the sinus so you know what you're dealing with, and avoiding excessive apical pressure, particularly when you're extracting maxillary molars. Visually, you're going to see this black hole, and you see right through to the sinus membrane. You'll hear this hollow sound if you put the suction there. And if you irrigate the socket, the patient will feel this weird sensation because the irrigant goes right through into the sinus and possibly into the nose, so the patient starts to sputter. Treatment in this case, if we have a diameter of less than two millimeters, no additional precautions are needed, but of course we should monitor this and give clear instructions to the patient. Tell the patient, uh, to sneeze or cough only with their mouth open, to not blow their nose, don't poke at this area, etc. It's also not a bad idea to throw a suture in there, in there just to achieve some closure. For two to six millimeters, I, I learned the four A's and a figure eight suture. So the four A's are antibiotics, antihistamines, analgesics, and afrin nasal spray. That's A-F-R-I-N nasal spray. So those four A's can be prescribed for the patient. Afrin is a vaso vasoconstrictor used twice per day to relieve sinus pressure. And if we have a sinus exposure greater than six millimeters, which is quite large and quite rare, then a flap surgery for a primary closure is indicated. Sinus exposure can lead to more serious complications like sinusitis, inflammation and infection of the sinus cavity, or an oroantral fistula where the communication epithelializes and forms a channel between the two cavities. Next we have alveolar osteitis, otherwise known as the dreaded dry socket. So you get this uh, exposed bony socket and the clot could dislodge or dissolve before the wound heals following an extraction, and it's incredibly painful. The nerve is exposed, the bone is exposed, it's incredibly painful. And if you've ever experienced a dry socket, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So this is why it's really important to curette the socket after an extraction and ensure we can stimulate some bleeding and later hemostasis. And it's also just as important to give very clear post-op instructions to the patient on how to keep this clot in place and allow the best healing to take place. So we can use a collagen plug or gel foam 
which we would place into the socket to help a clot form and reduce the risk of dry socket in high risk cases. It does not require antibiotics. A lot of uh, dental professionals will prescribe antibiotics, but it's actually not necessary, at least according to the board standards. So if we had a patient come in after an extraction, they're complaining of uh, all the symptoms related to dry socket, what would we do for treatment? Well, we'd get the patient numb, we'd flush the socket to remove any food debris, and then pack a medicated dressing or dry socket paste. And um, this medicated paste contains eugenol, and it has this soothing quality as well as some anti-inflammatory and antibacterial properties. Now for those of you keeping count, this is the fourth time we've seen eugenol in our videos. The first time was in endo as a primary ingredient in gutta percha and root canal filler. The second was in perio, where it was used in the periodontal pack after periodontal surgery. The third was in the PROS videos, it's an ingredient in temporary cement, and now it's one of the main ingredients in dry socket paste. So eugenol is all over the place. Now at home, after we do uh, this procedure to help uh, give the patient some pain control, they can use an ice pack, uh, some gentle warm salt water rinses to help keep the area healing, and some over-the-counter pain medications or prescribed pain medications as needed. Next is nerve injury. And I referenced this before, it's most common with lower third molars and the inferior alveolar nerve, which runs sometimes very close to those root tips. And so this is something I would absolutely refer to an oral surgeon because the risk of nerve injury is high. So it can manifest as uh, paresthesia or dysesthesia, this num numbness or tingling or pins and needles sensation in the area that the IAN or uh, associated nerves uh, innervates. And so uh, treatment right away for the patient would be a medrol dose pack. This is methylprednisolone, which is a steroid to treat inflammation. Patients with numbness lasting more than four weeks should be referred for a microneurosurgical evaluation. And our last, last complication with regards to tooth extraction is tooth displacement. Now, if I could, this whole slide would be red text because it's so, so important. I cannot stress this enough. The order of impacted teeth and congenitally missing teeth was important. This whole slide is critical to know for the board exam as well. So the maxillary first, maxillary second molars most likely displace into the maxillary sinus. Again, we we're talking about the sinus exposure, avoiding excessive apical pressure with the forceps. We'll talk about extraction technique in, I believe, the third video in this series. Uh, so that is very important to avoid tooth displacement into the sinus, which is a serious complication. The maxillary third molar is actually not most likely to go into the maxillary sinus, but into the infratemporal fossa. And that's probably the most common boards question I know of from the oral surgery section. So that the maxillary third molar displaces into the infratemporal fossa most commonly. The mandibular third molar is most likely to dip displace into the submandibular space. And if there's a tooth lost into the oropharynx or the patient swallows it, we want to send them to the ER as soon as possible for chest and abdominal x-rays so that we can track that tooth and know where it is. All right, so that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found it helpful in your studies and preparation for the board exam. Um, that's it for this video, but we will have many more coming uh, for instrumentation and oral surgery techniques, so definitely stay tuned for those. Again, thank you so much for watching. If you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out my Patreon page. A huge thank you to Michael Raja and all of my patrons for their support. 
You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions. So go check that out. The link will be in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone. I'll see you all in the next video.